white beam, to me, is a, a very intriguing upset possibility. She should be four, five, six to one. Thank you for visiting Pass the Wire TV, the YouTube channel of PassTheWire.com. Tracking trips with Pick 6 King, John Stetton. It's one of the best tools in horse racing for any level of player. It's your second set of eyes. Spotting troubled trips, betting angles, track trends. Horses to watch and favorites to fade. 10 figs, ticket structure, and more. At Tracking Trips, you're a friend with benefits. Not a member? You must hate winning money. Join Tracking Trips now. Visit PassTheWire.com and we'll see you in the winner circle. Remember, nobody does it better. Frankie Vittori. Ciao, Frankie. Tutta posto. Tutta posto, yes, that's a good start. So you, have, you, you haven't lost your Italian. Frankie Dettori, legend, world-class jockey, one of the best ever to sit in the saddle, ambassador to the sport of kings. Meet Frankie during his fanfare like never before, only on Pass the Wire TV. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Pass the Wire TV. Finally, I am here with Jeff Franklin, who is currently with Thurgraph. Uh, He's got an interesting background. He'll tell you that in a minute. But we are going to finally get to talk, Jeff, about the bounce, uh, something that I think is often misunderstood and, interestingly enough, misunderstood by people who believe in it and also by people who don't believe in it, and they, they just don't re really know what it is. Uh, so we'll get to that, and when we're done, hopefully everybody will at least understand what a bounce is, and that a horse can bounce and still win, and you know all of that kind of you know interesting stuff. But for those who don't know you, you've got a, a, a extremely interesting background in the game, um, done a lot of different things. Tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got in in, in the game, and some of the different things you've done. Happy to, John, and thanks again for having me. Um, this happens to be one of my favorite topics, so this is going to be a labor of love. So here we go. Okay. Uh, uh, I'm the bounce that is, not me. Um, right. Anyway, so uh, uh, it, it, I had a weird journey into horse racing. My dad owned a couple of claiming horses. Uh, I was a petroleum engineer, and uh, I was working in Bakersfield, California, about two hours north of LA, uh, and uh, got lucky and with some friends drilled a well that made a little bit of money. So I invested in some race horses. Uh, I used to train them down in Mexico uh, okay. because it's very inexpensive to train down there, old, old Caliente racetrack, which is no longer uh, right. anymore. But um, I got to know a guy named Carlos Delgadillo, who was the leading jockey in Mexico. He was telling me one day he needed an agent. And I said, well, look it, I'm winding down at the oil field. Why don't I, you know, become your agent for two weeks? I'll introduce you to a real agent at Del Mar, um, you know, get you set up there. I have lots of friends at the racetrack, and there we go. Well, five days later, uh, five days into the meet, Carlos is tied with Lafitte Pinkai for to be leading rider, and I found myself the next 15 years I was a jocks agent. I, uh, I represented the Gary Stevens and Pat Valenzuela, Jose Santos. Okay. Uh, Won Breeders' Cups, uh, won the Derby in 1988 on Winning Colors. And, wow. Uh, oh, so you were Gary's agent when Winning Colors won, huh? I was, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's, that's fantastic, man. That's yeah. great. 
Yeah, yeah and uh, God rest his soul, Jeff Lucas was one of my better friends. So oh, yeah. that was a really meaningful time in my life. And um, so uh, many years later, um, I went to work for, um, I was called by a guy named Marty Wygod, who people raised in California know Marty. Who's I, I know he is, absolutely. Okay. And he had sold his company for an enormous amount of money. He calls me one day and he says, Jeff, I want you to leave the racetrack. Come to work for me. Build me a racing stable. And when Marty Wagner calls, you know, you just, you do it. And uh, so as luck would have it, about two years later, we, we were just doing great. And I get this, this other call from these guys who want to do this thing called online betting. And they've been doing it in Asia on personal computers. And the idea, geez, John, just really appealed to me. The next thing you know, six months later, I'm working with that company, uh, eventually got away from the racetrack altogether. I became president of the company. We were known as youbet.com. We were the biggest. I, 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 listen, I was an original, one, of the, one, of, one of the original members of you. Oh, is that right? Absolutely. When I found yeah. out about it, I'm like, this is the greatest thing since sliced bread. Why didn't anybody think it is before? This is, this is phenomenal. Um, yeah, it, it was. I remember the biggest pet peeve back then, <laughs> and that was before technology. The only really issue was the streaming. The streaming was terrible. Right. It used to freeze, and you, you know, it was just so hard to watch the races. But other than that, I thought it was the greatest thing ever. Love right. it. Right, and then as as broadband came out, we went from fourteen four baud modems to fifty six k to broadband. And at that point, we went from you know the video clips. Remember the horses would just like kind of start. Yes, and, exactly. You know, Right. To now, you know, most of the ABWs, of course, offer four or five streams at, at the same time. And, and that's right. not really good. But um, so since that time, I've been uh, basically involved in online betting. I have been the president of UBET, uh, the CEO of ExpressBet. Um, I worked with Naira take, uh, developing what's now known as Naira Bets from the old days of Naira Rewards. I right. uh, worked with a number of the global technology companies to bring their technology here to the U.S., and one of the things along the way, I've always, uh, as a jocks agent, I always use Thoroughgraph to help me guide, you know, particularly in Gary's career and, and P. Val's career, uh, Thoroughgraph was just coming on the West Coast. And so I got to know Jerry. And all these years later, you know, one day he calls me and goes, hey, you know, I'd really like to get, I've got like 40,000 customers. I'd like to get an ADW. Uh, uh, affiliation would you help me out so i set them up with naira bets and now uh you know if you set up a thoroughgraph account and you have a naira bets account we can link them and there's, there's neat perks better rebates and free stuff so that's what i do now and uh, it's it's a tremendous amount of fun and uh i i you know i really love being able to interact with the players and, and bring up topics like this because um you know, I, uh, let's be honest, I had Thoroughgraph in California. I was the first person to have it. Wow. And everybody's one Hollywood Park meet. I think uh, Gary had like 81 wins and Lafitte had like 40. He was second. And everybody right. was saying, how'd you do it? I'm not going to tell them that I had the sheets, but, you know, right. I, knew, I knew the horses really yeah. well, but, you know, the benefit of what Jerry gave me. So here we are. It's it, it it really is when 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 you understand it an, an invaluable and, and and phenomenal tool. Um, I, I I remember I, I I was introduced to the sheets um, many 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 years ago. There were a couple of guys, and this is when hardly anybody used them. Okay, there were a couple of guys, and I don't even think Thoroughgraph was out yet. These were the, these these were the ragazins. Um, Ultimately, when I got familiar with Thoroughgraph, I, I migrated to Thoroughgraph and that became my product of choice. But my first introduction were the, these couple of guys that were very big betters at Naira. They were at the track every day. Um, and they used to just take down big scores, you know, and everybody knew who they were. And I'm like, I don't know how they come up with some of these horses sometimes. And I remember one day, you know, we had kind of like a nod hello kind of relationship. And one day, one of them just happened to say to me, who do you like? And I said to him, oh, I like this Philly, um, Jose Santos was riding named Caratone that was shipping in from, from Woodbine into a stake at, at Belmont. And he made a strange face and he looked at me and said, I don't know, because if you like that horse, you probably shouldn't bet the race. And he walked away. And I looked at my friend, I said, who says that to somebody? That's like insulting. If you like that horse, don't bet the race. Who's he think he is that guy? 
Fair enough, the horse run goes off like five to two, runs up the track. So the next day I see him, and I'm like, why did you say that? Ah, she was too slow. I says, sit down. You got to explain this whole thing to me. And that was my introduction. He took the time to sit down, spent about an hour and a half. Um, and that was my introduction. Ultimately, I migrated to, to Thoroughgraph. And, and what made me a believer in the, in, 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 in the bounce, this had to be, Jeff, and I wish I could remember the horse, but I don't. But it was Bobby Franklin. He was up at Saratoga, okay? He probably liked me because I was from Brooklyn and he was from Brooklyn. You know, he was probably a California guy by, by, by this time, primarily anyway, but he was all over the place. And he was at Saratoga and we watched a race together on the TV um, near the paddock area, okay? And he had a, a horse that win by maybe seven, eight lengths, drawing away, um, easy, ears up, pricked, under wraps, Jerry Bailey rode the horse, and he cursed, son of, SO, son of a bitch, after she went. I'm like, why are you cursing? He goes, ah, she ran so too, too fast. He goes, I don't know what the number is, but she ran too fast. I'm like, but she did it so easy. So he goes, let me explain something to you. And I never forgot it. He goes, doesn't matter how easy it looks. He goes, when a horse runs that fast, she's going to get a low number. He goes, and if she gets a really fast number, he goes, my biggest job is to make sure she doesn't, doesn't regress. And I'm pointing for this race at Keeneland. This wasn't the race I wanted to win. And now he goes, no matter how they act, no matter what they do, no matter how you think they're doing, or for a race like this, you always got to worry that they bounce or regress. And that's where I heard the term. And I learned about it. And since then, and like I said, this is maybe the late 80s, um, I've seen it work and work and happen and happen and happen. And it's something I've studied and like to think I've, I've perfected at least to the best of my ability and understanding it. And, uh, you, you know, knowing or having a pretty good idea what it is and when it's going to happen. Um, so, if I could interrupt just for a sec, John, yeah, because Frankel was a savant. Um, he, he was a really good friend of mine and Bobby and I would discuss the sheets every day at the races. I'd sit, in fact, right. I sat in the box at Hollywood Park every day. And um, and he, um, how can I say it? He organically knew so much of what the sheets can actually put numbers behind, but he got, he had that feeling. You know, the other guy who just instinctively knew it was Charlie Whittingham. And you like this story. I, well, I was Santos's agent. We rode the San Juan Capistrano, mile three quarter race. Um, and we run second uh, on the Source River Warden. And uh, I go back to the barn like two days later, and I go, CW, where, you know, which of these races at Hollywood do you want to run? And he goes, uh, Jeff, we're not running at Hollywood. And I say, oh my gosh, is the horse all right? And he goes, horse is great. And he goes like, son, you got to understand something. When thoroughbreds ex exert themselves, they don't have like the natural mechanism that we humans do that says shut it down. They throw everything they got out there and they will pay a price for it. So that is kind of like the corollary to bouncing. When you see a horse that can run, that can put too much energy into an effort, something it either is not prepared for or just is like a superhuman effort, they will regress. And that's what the bounce is. And right. the numbers prove it. Right. So, you know, many times for those guys who are listening, who, who haven't used the sheets before, really, it's kind of like a, a negative speed rating. So the lower the number, the thoroughgraph number, the faster the horse runs. So if John's baby's running 12s and Jeff's dreams is running 15s, John's baby's going to beat Jeff's dream by three lengths, more or less, 12s right. versus 15s. Where it comes really interesting is when you have a horse that is, let's say it's lightly raced and it runs 15, 15, 15, seven. Now that's the kind of thing that is generally the kiss of death. And for us betters is the opportunity of a lifetime. Why? Because they see a horse run fourth, 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 wins by eight. Everybody goes, oh my gosh, look what this horse, this is a brand new horse. Right. Sheet users go, no, thank you, hombre. This horse is probably gonna run 11 or 12 in right. the start. It's going to bounce 15, 15, 15, 7, 11 or 12, 11 or 12, then run back to the seven. Fine. Right. Right. So that's what we refer to as the bounce. And it is strictly physiological. 
uh, you know, a horse pours their guts into it. It takes time to recover. Right. And so I don't know if I stole your thunder there and I threw too much. No, out. no, no, no. This, this, this is what I'm looking for. This is what I, 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 you know, I want people to understand because, you know, I learned to understand it and then watched it. Uh, and the other thing for better is that 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 goes hand in hand with what you said, Jeff, is that because they see that 15, 15, 15, seven and think now, wow, this horse is faster, better, in great form, he's going to run back. They're a short price. So not only do you have an opportunity to, to bet against the horse, but you're betting against the horse that a lot of people are betting on. So it creates a bit of an edge, uh, you, you know, and, and it's and, not a bit of an edge. It's, to me, it's the golden goose. I mean, right. Yeah. And every, you see everybody else, you know, jumping on this three to five shot that just won by six lengths and you're fading that horse and looking at for somebody else who's 12 to one. And also the flip side holds true. 15, 15, 15, 7, 11. Everybody said, oh, he ran poorly. Well, you and I are going to say, wait a sec. He's going to he's going to curve back to the seven. And right. now he's 10 to one. And now we bet on him. And he curves back to the seven. So right. there are two flips to the balance, betting, knowing when to bet against a horse and knowing when that regression is logical, predictable, and part of development. That's the key. And if 100%. you percent yeah. And um, so what makes it really interesting is people always ask, well, how do I know when a horse is going to bounce? Um, you know, are there times when a horse, uh, when a bounce is more predictable, et cetera? So there, there are a lot of guidelines, but let me throw out two or three things that I think would be useful. One is um, three-year-olds tend to are in development mode, uh, you know, from January till about August they tend to bounce less than other horses. They're growing up, they're getting bigger, faster, stronger. Yeah, a 15, 15, 15, seven would still probably result in a bounce. But if you saw 15, 15, 15, 10, that horse might just be developing. The teenager is becoming a man. Right. And you might see 15, 15, 15, 10, eight, four, et cetera. And if you see what's happening to, with a lot of the triple crown horses and Last week in the Haskell, we saw the first four finishers all ran lifetime tops. They ran right. faster than ever. And everybody could mistakenly say, oh my gosh, they're going to all bounce next time. No, they're not. They're developing. Right. Right. So the one asterisk to this whole formula is when you see a three-year-old developing, um, a three-year-old running new tops, you know, be, be careful not to predict the bounce. They may just be developing. On the other hand, you see a five-year-old, old claiming horse, 12, 12, 12, 6, slam dunk to, to, to bounce. Of right. course, there are exceptions. What if, uh, you know, some poor guy from, you know, from, uh, you know, Gulfstream Park ships up to New York. Linda Rice claims the horse. She works on it for 90 days. It runs a six for her, first time for Linda. No, I'm not going to, I'm not going to confidently predict that'll bounce. She might've found something. She's turned the right. horse around. So right. we have to use some logic, but now you get the idea. It, it, this is a way of thoroughbred putting a number behind that alerts us. This horse might be set up to bounce. And as you said, perfectly for, for value, this is exactly what you want to, this is exactly the scenario you want to bet against a horse. The public's right. betting the heck out of them. And, um, a lot of us just yesterday bet against the funded um, down at Del Mar. He actually missed the board at three to five. I think he might have gone four to five at the end. But it was kind of like a lot of the same reasons. And uh, when horses regress, it's it, it particularly on the main track, it usually can be profound. I right. e, we're not talking 15, 15, 15, 7, 8. It could be 15, 15, 15, 7, 14. They fall right. apart. They, right. They're exhausted. And it's tough as human beings to really gauge, if you're a trainer, how much effort that horse has put in. And some of the good guys like Frankel and Whittingham, uh, they had that, that skill to do it. Right. And, 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 and like you said, I, I mean, I, I never forgot what he told me because it looked to me like the horse ran so easy, you know, and they ran the race. You know, it was a, I think it was a seven eighths race and they ran it in like, you know, 120 in a couple of ticks or 121. And I'm like, but he did it so easy. He goes, well, he said, well, let me ask you something. He goes, 
how fast if he wasn't, if it didn't look so easy to you, how fast do you think he was going to run seven eights? He goes, you can't run faster than that. He goes, it doesn't matter how it looked. He goes, he's not going to run any faster than that. Maybe a tick faster if the, if the, if the rider asks him, because you can't run faster than that. He goes, that's going to take a lot out of the horse. He goes, and now I got to worry about that next race. And it made sense how he explained it. And I started to pay attention to it. And like you said, you've got to also apply common sense, okay? Um, you have to know the trainer, know, know if it's a, a guy who or girl who cranks their horses up, you know, full speed every race or a guy who points to a race and, 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 and whatnot. And, and, you know, on the pattern shows I've been doing, that's a lot of what I look at, you know what I mean? And try and look at. Mandela fooled me in, in the Haskell. It's the first time since I've been doing him this year that a horse fooled me because the horse, I like when a two-year-old turns three and runs faster than his best two-year-old number. And Go Rocket Ride didn't. He, he ran a tick slower. And I'm like, well, I'm just not so sure if he's as good as I thought he was or as fast as he was going to be. What I underestimated was Mandela, how patient he is, how he brings them along, and how, you know... You just, you're giving us all great advice. And, you, you know, know, it's so funny. You just stole my thunder because I was going to bring up between Whittingham, Frankel, and Mandela... Before you said his name, I was going to say, these are guys who you look at their sheet patterns and you'll see incremental, beautiful development. And it might look like 12, 10, 8, 6, 5, 3, right. 1, 1, 1. Right. Those are guys who know how to develop a horse. And right. They, and that, that, just, those are my dream betting patterns. And I've talked about that on the shows. You know, when I see that, you know, steady, slight progression, you know, um, I know the peak is coming, you know what I mean? And, 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 and I, to me, one of the things that I love making a big bet on is a horse that I am relatively confident on thoroughbred is coming to their peak race or best race or, or going to, you know, equal what their best race is. That's when I really bet the biggest and with the most confidence, you know, um, when that scenario falls into, into, into place, because it's, like you said before, it's, you know, it's kind of like the golden goose. Um, when you're betting against the, you know, a horse you think is going to bounce. The flip side is betting a horse, you know, and recognize is coming to a peak. Um, and you I know, love that scenario. you probably, I'm sure you've observed this as well, John, you'll see a horse who runs, let's say um, seven, 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 you know, say a four-year-old suddenly runs through the TV and runs a zero. Many, many, many times won't see that horse run for seven or eight months. Right. It just completely whacks him. And so at that point, the quote unquote bounces behind us. You know, it's because he's he literally has been given enough time or she to completely recover. And then it's a brand new race horse. You're starting you're recalibrating new baseline, right? Right. But what I always caution guys, there are two scenarios that are particularly dangerous for the bounce. One is a horse that comes back quickly, and you can envision it. Some guy claims a 12-5 a, a claimer, horse wins by seven, you know, again, 15, 15, 15, seven, wheels him back in eight days because his horse just galloped. He said, look how good this horse is. Boom, he runs up the track. Everybody says, what happened? Well, we know. So right. beware of time. And time, except for the aforementioned, like many, many months, does not usually prevent a bounce. It takes a horse a long time to recover. Now, five, six months, sure. But five, six weeks, usually not. Usually they're right. still going to regress. And that might look like 15, 15, 15, 7, 10 instead of 15, 15, 15, 7, 15, right? right? Okay. The second thing is a surface change. So given our example here again, the horse just ran the seven, suddenly it's a sloppy track or a triumph on turf or something like that. In many cases like that. Uh, the surface change will exacerbate the bounce and they will bounce to the moon. We've heard that expression. They'll right. just see them. You need to search right. okay. You know, I, I have a theory. I don't know. I don't know if it's something you, you probably have a better chance of, of solidifying it than, 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 than I do. And probably a trainer might have more insight, but I don't know that anybody really can. I think it, it might be just too subjective, but I got a theory about that. 
that layoff and them still bouncing, okay? When you talked about the five, six, seven week range, okay? I think some of that sometimes is also a little mental with the animal, okay? I do work with a lot of animals, okay? I'm not a horse trainer, but I do a lot of rescue work and I work with with, with a lot of dogs that have been abused and hurt and stuff like that. And, and you know, I've, I've learned a lot about animal interaction and animal behavior. And I think that there's a chance that when a horse puts out an effort and gets taxed like that, okay, and comes back and gallops out and feels the stress, it's like, you know, you or I doing a, a marathon, a 20 mile run, you know what I mean? You feel it. The next time you go run, even if you take a couple of weeks off, you're fresh, you go back, you remember that. Horses are not on our same intellectual level. So I think that sometimes it's in their head, hey, last time I ran, woof, that really, knocked me for a loop and they may not put everything into it the way that they might horses i think sometimes protect themselves a little bit and maybe don't don't go all out now that's my crazy mind just working and kind of i don't of think it's crazy right. at all in fact it's it's been proven to me uh exactly as you stated it a million times. And again, as an agent for all those years, I had the benefit every morning walking to the track with Whittingham and Frankel and all the great trainers. And we'd watch a set of horses go out and they would say things just like you said, I'm bringing, I'm bringing John's baby back off a four month layout. Doggone it. She just look at, she's hot. She's not liking her work. I got to find a way to calm her down. They sense it. And they, they need to get that confidence back, which is why so many times you'll see a horse that will be like the professional maiden and suddenly something kicks in and they've right. got their confidence. And what do they do? A other than two other than uh, right. They go right three, right. you know, bang, right. just reel them off. Right. So, People will call it the light bulb went off or something like that. That's right. Exactly. That's right. So you're smart to really uh, incorporate that into your thinking. And it, I think it's very wise uh, as it relates to bounce theory. Okay. So the horse just ran that zero, they give him six months off, but remember, yeah, uh, you know that example. Let's say they did six, 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 zero, crushed themselves. They got to get fit again. So too many people off the layoff will say, "I was going to run the zero. No, let him get fit again. Let him get his confidence back. Right. And then probably we'll get back to the zero. Right. And exactly. That's where common sense comes in. Right. Exactly. And that and that that's where you really find those edges when you can anticipate that kind of stuff and factor that kind of stuff into your handicapping, which is why I tell people. You know, you have to take your arsenal of tools and kind of learn how, you know, to use them all. And 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 at the end of the day, use all of that to paint the the right kind of picture in in in, in your mind. And you know, one of the things people you, you know criticize me about in 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 my play, and I I, I kind of shrug it off because I mean I I went for twenty something years, Jeff. Where I made my living betting horses. I had no other source of income. If I didn't win, I didn't eat. And I'm not talking about playing to grind out a little bit of profit. I mean, I had to pay my way by what I won. You know what I'm saying? Which is a different animal than just grinding out a little profit. You know what I mean? Um, and, y you know, I, I, I learned to play certain ways and attack the game certain ways. And one of the things I don't like to do is beat myself. And by that, I mean watch a race, watch a result and say, oh, how did I miss that? So to me, I can't do 10, 20 races a day. You know what I mean? I can't do three or four tracks. I could never, I can handicap with the best of them and play with the best of them, but I could never win the NHC because I can't watch all of those tracks and do 25 races in a day. It takes me four or five hours, six hours to do the pick four or the pick five or the pick six if I'm going to do it. You know what I mean? Um, that's just me. You know what I mean? I watch replays. I take notes. I do thoroughbred. I do past performances. I go back, watch a few replays again. I, you know, it takes, it takes time, but I don't beat myself. When I come, I come prepared. You know, we're all wrong more than we're right. I don't care how good you are, but I, I, you know, I learned a long time ago, I can't afford um, as a, as a, as a player to miss something that's there. You know what I mean? There are going to be head scratchers. We know that, um, it's part of the game. Uh, but a lot of times, you know, after the race, you'll go and you'll look and you know what? Okay. This makes sense to me now. 
I'm not saying I recognize everything, but that happens less because I put in more of the work and study, you know, study the patterns, study the past performances. So a lot of times it may be a situation I could say, hey, I would never bet that horse even now knowing the result, but I'm not shocked that he won. If you understand, if you, if you know I do. what I No, I do. And in fact, I have kind of a, you know, let's say a variant of, of the same approach. And that is over the years, I've perfected like two or three thoroughbred patterns that I kind of mastered in my own mind where it's really what I bet on. Right. And I, so I'll either find that pattern, that setup, or I'll, you know, I can go through every race pretty darn quickly. And it might take 10 minutes to do mom 10 minutes to do Gulf Street, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And then I'll isolate four or five races and I'll dive into those. Right. And, and like you, I hate missing a detail. And it's one reason why Thorograph is, is uh, for me personally, an awesome tool because not only do I get the best speed ratings in the business, but a lot of the other stuff that surrounds the sheet um, is, is very, very useful. You know, trainer percentages, ROIs, all that. Love it, love it, love it, love it, love it. Um, I, I, I actually wish, and we can tell Jerry this, you can tell us, I really wish that he would get a little bit more detailed in the past performances. Now, at least they do. He's got the past performances up there. I would love to see them a little bit more where I could just use that instead of, instead of having to use both. You want to know what I do? I actually, okay, go into formulator, okay, which is the, 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 the yeah. past performance I use, and I write the thoroughbred numbers in there. Okay, okay. each race, yeah. you know what I mean? Okay. Um, mm -hmm. and then make little hieroglyphic notes, who's going up, who's going down, who's level this and that, and make my, my, my notes about the patterns. Um, it, it take, it, it, it's time consuming. I would love to have that done. You know, I'd be, I'd be more than willing to, to, to pay for it, to be able to export that right, right into, 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 into my formulator, you know, but, uh, I don't think that technology is available yet, but I love the additional information that's there. Um, like you said, it, it is, it is helpful. Um, it's very beneficial and I love having it on, on, on the one sheet like that. You know what I mean? Where you can just, you know, look at it and, 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 and it kind of, kind of jumps out at you. Um, and, and again, so what I'm hoping that folks will take away from this discussion is when they do see a potential bounce candidate to ask themselves, is this horse developing? Is it regressing or is it stabilizing? And there's not like a hundred different options. Just shoot, trust me, it's A, B, or C. Right. If you have a developing horse, no, it's pretty tough to trust the bounce. If you have an old stable horse and he does, and he suddenly whacks forward to, to do something, uh, they're, they're gonna bounce, man. It's just that simple. And then if you have a regressing horse, you know, a $32,000 claim, you're dropping in 12.5, it's anybody's guess. And, you know, let's face it, you know, something's wrong with the animal. So there you go. Now, let's talk about this for a minute. Um, because a lot of people who don't believe in the bounce and say it's nonsense will throw this at me. And I try to explain to them, well, that, that's because you're not using Thorograph. You can't see what I see if you're not using Thorograph. And it'll be a horse, like you said, 15, 15, 15, 7. Now he comes back and runs a 12. So we know he bounced, but he won the race anyway, because the 12 was good enough to win the race. And I have people say, oh, see, the bounce is nothing. The horse won. He didn't bounce. I'm like, no, he did bounce. He just bounced and won anyway. And sometimes when you calculate or I handicap a race, I see the bounce coming and I see, okay, this horse can go back five points, six points, but that's still good enough to make him a contender here. So he's not an automatic toss if the predicted right. bounce is good enough to win the race. So talk a little bit about that because a lot of people give me that argument and I try and explain it. Um, so elaborate so, on that a little bit. No, it's, it's, a, it's a great discussion because there are two things that, um, you know, people have always have for 30 years have said the same thing to me. So I have two comments. One is, honestly, John, most of the people who question the bounce altogether um, have never trained heavily themselves. Any of us who have gone to a gym and gone to a squat rack and you go from 250 and you're trying to show off with the boys and you go to 280 and then you can't walk for three days, you know, you know what it's like. 
And anybody who has been through that is probably smiling right now. And it's like, yep, been there, brother, done that. Got it. I believe in the bounce. So then the other thing you said is, is correct. And that is, what if um, anytime you look at a race, what if everybody else is running 14s? Let's right. say it's a starter allowance. Perfect example. Okay. 15, 15, 15. Horse runs for maiden 25, runs a seven. Comes back four weeks later and a start of 40. Everybody else is running 13s. All right, he wins at 11. He runs at 11 and still wins. Right. They're just slower horses. And so all that a bounce means is that there will be a numerical regression in that pattern. It doesn't guarantee victory. It doesn't guarantee defeat. Right. It just means we're going to regress. And right. it's up to you and I now. When you see the 15, 15, 15, 7, you're looking at the race and everybody else is running sixes, sevens, and eights, you better be betting against that horse because it's very unlikely you're going to get that seven. And he's probably going to just burn a lot of money, run a good fourth if he's trying hard, and we'll bet on him the next time or something. Right. And, uh, you know, as an agent, that was always a big conundrum because you just, you know, you put the horse in for maybe 25, runs to the TV, runs the seven, trainer comes back and says, boy, he came out great. There's an A other than that in four days. And you go, oh my God, don't do this to me. Right. <laughs> you know, right. you, you right. know what's going to happen, right? Right, right. So, yeah, no, a hundred percent. And and it goes back to that thing that 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 Frank and, and like you said, one of the best ever. And he would say, I don't care how they act, you, you know, I don't care what they're doing. He goes, it's just so hard to know um if they're going to regress off those or or off those those kind of numbers. Um, right. And, and, you know, if, if you don't mind me getting a little off topic on Frank, no, because this is really pretty useful. You know, Bobby used to give, Bobby was so aware of the importance of ground loss right? that he would instruct the jocks to save ground at all costs. And he would say, if you get shut off on the rail turning for home, it's on me. I will not take you off the horse. Right. And one of the key things in thoroughbred that is not correctly incorporated, I believe, in other speed rating systems is ground loss. And we've all seen it. A horse goes four wide in the first turn, four wide in the second turn, runs fifth, and then comes back in the next start and annihilates everybody else with the ground saving ride, right? Well, the, the number would tell you that. That horse, even though he ran fifth, probably ran the best number in the rest. And Frankel instinctively knew that. Yeah, I, you know, I've gotten to the point where, and 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 I've 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 shocked some people. Um, I'm friends with uh, the owner of Mage, and I've I, I, I've had conversations with him, and I've I've predicted and called the numbers that he's ran in some of the races. Um, a lot of times, I can watch a race and tell you, you know, what what, what the number is is going to be, and usually I'm spot on or pretty close. You know what I mean? I may not get you know, the quarter's right, you know what I mean? It may be a, you know, two and a quarter, two and a half, but I said, you're going to run into twos, you know, um, it's going to come back in, 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 in the, in the twos. So I pride myself on, on, on being able to recognize that. Um, another great angle that we can touch base on, and I know, you know, this is, this is the balance, but one of the things that I love um, about, about, about the graph, and, and, and this comes from the days when, they still had the two dollar pick six, and the pick six was my was my main bet. You know, now the pick six is really, for all intents and purposes, a wager of the past. You know, um, I'm, you know, Derby Day and Breeders' Cup Day are the only days I really I really look at it. You know, uh, but I used used to be my main bet. And one of the greatest things is is when you look at a race and you analyze a race, and they were just horses that no matter how they look in the form or how they're um, raw speed figures like buyers or brisnet numbers or anything like that, which not to disparage them, but those are just raw numbers. You know what I mean? They're just they're right. big, primarily on time. When you just find a horse that, you know, maybe looks okay on paper, but is just too slow to win, you know, and just doesn't have a pattern that, is, that, 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 that suggests at all he's going forward and he's just, He's just a toss. He's just too slow. You know what I mean? Um, Happens all the time. And right. particularly when, um, you know, when household names are involved, right? So you get Todd Pletcher and Arad Ortiz, you know, with a horse that runs four tens in a row, and the public's not going to toss that horse because they're afraid to. And you and I look at each other and say, it's going to take a six to win this race. This horse is not going to, you know, and so you toss him. 
Right. Um, it's, it's, to, to me, that's one of my favorite scenarios. And that's that's invaluable when you're betting multi-race wagers like pick fours, pick fives and, you know, things like that, because, you know, you know, nine out of 10 times that horse is not going to beat you, you know, so it's 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 a it's a it's a relatively safe toss. So um, between that and the bounce, I think th those are phenomenal takeaways, you know, um, people tend to want to look at thoroughgraph and say, well, I'm just going to find who's got the fastest race and the fastest number. And that's the fastest horse. And that's who's probably going to win. And that's so far from the truth. You know, I mean, you have to look at well, the pattern and, and that's, you know, I would really hope if, if people would take anything away from this discussion, it's that thoroughgraph is basically a numerical story of a horse's racing talent. And it, you cannot, for the most part, you can't just say, oh, this one runs twos, this one runs fours, therefore the two will beat the fours. There's always a story behind it. Who's in the best? Is a horse developing? Is it regressing? You know, what about other conditions? Is it going to bounce today? All of these things. And right. it's, it's the best. Uh, I, I can't dream of handicapping without it to begin the process. But if you're not recognizing patterns, you lose your money. I don't care. Just give me your money. It's just right. It's, it's all in the patterns. I sat next to a guy at the Breeders' Cup a couple of years ago that used Starograph, right? Um, so now I had never never spent any time with him. And what this, what, what this guy did it was literally insanity. Um, didn't even use past performances, okay? Um, and he played in the Breeders' Cup betting challenge. He was, a, a rel relatively speaking, he was a, a, a large better. He had Thoroughgraph, and I watched him. I sat next to him, and he would look at the sheet, and in red pen, he would circle the horse's fastest number. Hello. Didn't matter where it was. Didn't matter if it was two years ago or last week or whatever. He would circle that hard when red, okay? And then he would look, and he would put the race in that order of the fastest, whatever. And if they were tied, they were all together. And he would bet according to that. And I'd be like, I got to ask you a question. I'm like, you don't look at the patterns and the history and what led to that and the circumstances and whether it was turf, dirt, same distance. It doesn't matter. Fastest horse is the fastest horse. I said, well, I got to ask you one question. Do you win money at the end of the year? Are you ahead? Because nobody's ahead. I'm like, that's not true. Very, there are some people that are ahead. Are you one? And he goes, no. He goes, no. I said, no. You got to ask yourself why. This is what, that, that is not the end. If it was that easy, okay, we'd be having this conversation on a beach in, 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 in Tahiti somewhere drinking pina coladas. It's not that easy. You can't just do that and, 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 and expect to win. And I, tried to, you know, get him a little bit more focused on the patterns and whatnot, but it was one of those situations where it didn't matter. That was the way he did well, it. He was convinced he was right. You know, something I'd also encourage guys to do is when Jerry does his seminars, uh, you know, and he charges for many of them, some he doesn't charge for over thoroughgraph. It, it really, to listen to the master talk and the way that he kind of holistically will present a horse's sheet. And you can see he's, he's doing everything that you and I are talking about. He's basically saying, here's the horse's relative talent. Here's where he is today. Here's what we can expect him to do, you know, in this race that's upcoming and here's why. And when you hear, when you hear this stuff over and over, the whole thing becomes demystified and you begin to think that way. And I, it's, it's really been a privilege to see so many guys become really studs at, at using the sheets and thinking along those lines. You know, I, I, I'm so glad that I decided to do those couple of shows, uh, the, the, you know, starting, I think, with the Kentucky Oaks by the Thoroughgraph Covers and Pat. I can't tell you, okay, how many emails that I have from people saying they're now Thoroughgraph users and their game has improved tremendously um, just, just by using thoroughgraph and some that have been using it but really weren't looking at the patterns um and i think the three-year-olds at this time of year is, is is just a great set of horses to really show pattern development on as opposed to older horses or or two-year-olds i think that you know the higher quality three-year-olds just are just a great set to to really showcase the patterns and the reliability of them right. but it's i've gotten countless emails even on the videos in the messages people are like 
game changer for me. Thank you so much. I'm so glad you. glad you did it. And it's phenomenal because I like I, I I love to see that, and you know, makes me feel like I'm giving back to the game a little bit, and um and and you, you know, just making people more competitive and more more profitable players. So that, that that's been a huge part of why I keep doing it. I'm going to do it this week um, for the test. Um, we're also going to do it for the Travers. Uh, and I'll probably then hold off and maybe do one of the Breeders' Cup races. Uh, right. But that's a really tough time for me, a busy time. We do a Breeders' Cup seminar too, and it's just a tough, busy time for me. But I'll try and do one of the Breeders' Cup races just, you know, by the, by the numbers and patterns and, 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 and get out there. Right. Uh, Get that out Please, John, well. anything Great. I can do to help, it would be a pleasure. And by the way, if, if any of the guys have a, a question, they can always just email me, jeff at thoroughgraphs.com. There and, you have it, people. Yeah, I do my best to, to treat everybody like brethren. And if a guy has a legitimate question, uh, I'm going to do my best to help them out. See, they, they, okay. there you have it, jeff at thoroughgraph.com. You've always been accommodating and great, great, great to me. Um, and, and again, you've got a, a fascinating history. I was, when I found out about, you know, well, I was surprised that you were an agent. Um, but when I found out that you were one of the, you know, you bet guys, I was like, wow, that, that really is a blast from the past for me. Um, I was an agent in New York for a very short time. Another. Uh, yeah, pro probably the worst jockey agent ever in the history. Okay. All right. I, I, I was a mutual clerk and knew nobody on the backside. OK, there was an exercise rider named Ralph Foresta, who also was a mutual clerk in the afternoon. OK, worked for Sid Waters, used to get on um, horses for, for, for Sydney Waters. And one day I was walking into Saratoga and there was a beautiful blue Corvette. Everybody's car on the backside was full of mud. This blue Corvette didn't have a speck of mud on it. I don't, still don't understand to this day how. And on the front bumper, there was a stick, a Naira agent, jockey agent. And I was like, I don't know what a jockey agent is, but I want to be one. And I wound up talking to this Ralph Foresta guy. We were, you know, mutual clerks together. And I said, you're, 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 you're an exercise rider. He goes, well, I'm a 10 pound apprentice. I'm trying to become a rider, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, well, why don't you get any mounts? He goes, I don't have an agent. Nobody will take my book. I'm like, I'll be your agent. How do I become one? Long story short, I took the test. Next day, I was an agent. Um, knew not a soul. Knew not what to do. Nobody wanted to help me. People said, go around, hand out overnights to the trainers in the morning, and ask them if you can get on horses. I had this poor kid getting on horses in the morning. I didn't know to ask the people for the mounts. They wouldn't have given me the mounts anyway. Um, I'm not a friendly guy to people I don't like to begin with. Um, so it just... What, what, what was I was I was the worst agent ever. I wound up also because um, he was just a super nice guy having um, Donald Smith, who is now a steward at Monmouth Park and Parks. Um, his dad was Gail Smith, who was involved in the triple dead heat and the Carter handicap. Um, oh. Rode weight a bit, but the Donald was a great guy. But I never did him any justice because, like I said, I I didn't know anybody on the backside back then and. I was never the type to say good morning to somebody I didn't know or anything like that. Um, I didn't know it even, I, it took me six months to find out I had to be at scratch time. You know what I mean? And that you can sometimes pick up mounts there and whatnot. And I lasted about two years though, knocking around. Um, I think we won between Donald, Ralph Foresta, I think maybe four or five wins, you know, over that two, two years. Pretty two exciting, years. right? It was, you know, in yeah. hindsight now, I wish I knew back then what I knew now and took it a lot more serious um, and really tried to learn it because who knows, you, you, you know, what, what, what could have happened. Um, but I think I was always destined to bet because I like, I loved betting and I loved the, 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 the opportunity to make money, large amounts of money fast. You know, once you have, you know, a hundred, two hundred thousand dollar day, OK, I mean, I had a pick six at Saratoga once for six hundred thousand. Once you do that and then do it a couple of times, it changes your whole outlook on 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 betting. You know what I mean? Because you now know that that's a realistic possibility. It's not a pipe dream. So it becomes your goal to make it happen again. You know, and, you know, it's hard for anything for me to compete with that type of earning. I'm not a stock market guy. I'm not anything like that. I like. 
let me take make my bet. And if I'm right, let me make it bet it in a way to make it count. You know what I mean? So I bet very aggressively. I bet ways that people say, you're crazy. You know, I'll bet the five to win and a five nine exacta. That's it. No nine five. You know what I mean? And people say, you're nuts. I'm like, no. When I win, I want to be right. If I'm right at five nine, I don't want to have one dollar on nine five because I feel like I'm losing the money. I don't bet against well, my opinion. I think most of the pros, um, first off, my own betting mentor, uh, a guy named Bill Gumpert, um, taught me basically exactly what he said is that you also have to look. So many times we gauge the reward, the benefit, and we fail to say, what was my total investment? So right. that is a four horse exacta box. It's a lot different than John's way of doing it nine, five, one way, right? right? And so, yeah, from a cash flow perspective, you'll have more valleys, but at the end of the year, you waste oh, a lot less money. In the that's program. what people don't understand. And one of the things I'll say on my shows is you have to understand this phrase and embrace it to beat the game. Cash less, but win more. Exactly. Yeah. You know? Um, and it's tough because I think it goes against a lot of people's nature. Our nature is to want to use every horse and cash as many tickets as we can. Um, and that's not the answer. The answer is to win as much as you can when you're right. Very good. Um, Jeff, absolute pleasure to have you on. I think this is great. Um, we'll do it again. We'll pick another topic. I think, you know, we got... We, we, we talked about the bounce, but we also talked about some peaks and valleys and, 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 and whatnot and a little, a little betting strategy. So it's a phenomenal conversation, I think. I hope people take away some, some positives. You can reach out to Jeff. You, you know, if you're watching this, you already know you can reach out to me. Um, and we'll do it again. We'll pick something else that, that we think people can get a lot out of and we'll, we'll do it again. Anytime you need me, I will be here. And uh, so I wish everybody a, a ton of luck. And uh, what we have next weekend, the Whitney, right? So uh, All right, we got the Whitney and then out in your neck of the woods, the Pacific Classic coming up. Yeah, um, yeah. And I think, I think Mandela's going to run that, that Haskell win a go rocket ride in the, in, the, in the Pacific Classic he's talking about. Really? Hmm. Yeah, he said, he said it's between, he said he's leaning Pennsylvania Derby or Pacific Classic against Older, which I thought was really interesting. He's not going into Travers and perfect example. You want to know why? Too soon. Well, uh, I'll tell you something else and then I will leave you because you've been so nice letting me tell my stories, but uh, I was Pat Bellin's Wales agent. We won the first Pacific Classic with Best Pal. He was right. a three-year-old going against Older. And it was a scenario very much like we see on the West Coast now, where there just wasn't a really good handicap division. Look at yesterday's San Diego handicap, right? right. Where your booster are um, real nice horse, but not a superstar. Right. So, and and if you look at the numbers, he runs zeros, and Go Rock and Ride ran is a zero as well when he won Haskell, uh, but he's going to get three four pounds. So right. I think it's three pounds in, in the classic and he's a developing horse. So right. there you go. So anyway, John, thank you for the time. And uh, I hope we do this again. This has been a lot of fun. Oh, absolutely. We'll, we'll definitely do it again. And for those of you so inclined on thoroughgraph.com, they have great, great tutorials, great, you, you know, beginner sheets. Don't be intimidated by it. If you go on there and you have questions, you can reach out to Jeff, reach out, out to me. Um, they've got great tutorials and great, you know, explanation sheets and stuff on there that you can look at before you even buy them uh, to get a feel for it. So don't, do not be intimidated by it. Um, it can help you game and, and, and there's people out there to help you um, to learn it. So thanks again, Jeff. Pleasure. I'll see you. I'll see you in November or I'll later yeah, on man. I'm out there. All right. Be well. All righty. Ciao. Talk soon. See you. Bye.
Gino Rosso has taken the lead. And it's a vintage performance by Vino Rosso. Hi, everybody. Dan Oman here with some exciting news. The RF Formulator, the gold standard in past performance information, is now free exclusively on DRF Bets. Join DRF Bets with the promo code WINNING. Get a $250 first deposit match bonus, a $10 free bet, and free Formulator already uploaded to your account. Access Formulator's premium features, including sortable trainer stats, race replays, personalized trip notes, and lots more. Free Formulator exclusively on DRF Bets. It is here, the big day, the day almost all of us in horse racing wait for, Breeders' Cup Saturday. It looks like we're gonna see some really, really impressive races on Saturday. It starts with the Philly and Mare Sprint. Uh, one of my stronger opinions on the card is, is Goodnight Olive to start things off. I think she gets a perfect trip. Goodnight Olive, six in a row and a Breeders' Cup champion. We've got modern games going in the turf mile for Godolphin. Uh, the Godolphin and Aiden O'Brien horses we said on Pass the Wire TV all week long on the backside. Those two contingents stuck out from all the rest. Modern Games looking for a, a, a big race in front of him. Modern Games storming down the center of the course. Modern Games, a two-time Raiders Cup winner. You bet he is. That is Rebels Romance, who in my humble opinion is one of Godolphin's uh, better chances this year. Rebels Romance is a very, very good looking Godolphin horse that can absolutely win this race. Rebels Romance is a must use. Rebels Romance, rolling on the outside, Portland well, got it, makes her bend down toward the inside. Rebels Romance down the center of the court, has it, hooks to home. Rebels Romance wins the turf over Stoney. We got Flightline that they're putting in the best ever category. There's no question that the race he ran in the Pacific Classic is one of the best races we've seen any racehorse run ever. It is Flightline, it is mind tingling, jaw dropping, awe inspiring, Secretariat like Raiders Cup Classic win. Does it better?